Hi everyone. Today I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, data visualization and especially or more precisely navigating uh, data viz within uh, Ember.js. Uh, I know it seems like someone does talk about it almost every year. Uh, but today I wanted to bring up uh, a bunch of questions rather than a breakthrough. Uh, trying to think about what can be the critical questions uh, to address before starting a data, visual data visualization project. This word is very hard to say. Um, so yeah, basically last year we have decided to revamp our dashboard at Ponto. Uh, so we are a all in one finance uh, solution for small and medium businesses. And those businesses needed to have a proper view of their cash flow, basically. And that went through four different stages. And starting the project, we thought that we'd be, it would be quite easy, actually, because it's very visual and it's quite easy to, to grasp. Uh, before we got to unveil the tricky parts of the project, like, how are we going to actually do this? Then we started to shed some light on the right path to take, the right approach to take uh, to deliver what the product team has been asking for before finally delivering according, everything according to the plan. So today I'm going to try to make a fast forward through the second stage and hopefully land you in the third one. Okay, let's switch from here. So I'm Aleti, uh, Fontaine Engineer at Ponto. Uh, I've been working mostly with Angular and now for a little bit more than a year with uh, Ember within Conto. So back to our navigation in DataViz, uh, it's not straightforward to draw graphics on the web most times. We have a range of different technologies and the major ones uh, I cited is so, uh, SVG and Canvas. SVG stands for Scalable Vector Graphic. So as the name states, it relies on vectors and it, it makes it very uh, uh, suitable for responsive design. It's uh, the best for print as well. On the, on the other side, we have Canvas, which takes a really different approach, which is uh, bitmap based. And it's very good when it comes to rendering a lot of data points, when you really want to focus on performance and having larger data sets. But for both of them, what's, what happens usually is you have a, some kind of black box effect. So the graphical part is a separated part from the rest of the app. And the question that remains is how do you make it to have the same standards as for the rest of your code base for everything that comes to graphics? So how do you make it to target every rendered element precisely? How do you make it to describe them? To implement testing and accessibility? All in all, how do you ensure the right level of scalability for your data visualization project? So for this talk, this is going to be our pathway. We're going to try to run through different scenarios and just to put in context uh, for different cases, uh, how to put a dashboard, how to make it, uh, to set it up first, how to make a simple chart. Then we're going to add some complexity, see how we can uh, do different types of chart, how easy it is with different libraries. Try to go a little bit further with uh, interactivity. So make the chart interactive, fully customized, fully looking like the rest of our products. And then we'll have a word about uh, accessibility and testing in the world of uh, data visualization. I'm going to try to extract some, some key drivers out of all of this, uh, key drivers for technical decisions and how to justify them uh, later on. So the first technical commitments to make when it comes to making a dashboard is choosing a charting library, definitely. And we don't, we don't really want to be limited if we want to add uh, further capabilities along the way later on uh, in the project, but we don't want to spend too much time anticipating on needs if they are very unlikely to emerge. Uh, so here is a selection of uh, packages that are available uh, in the Ember ecosystem as it's way easier to comply with Ember guidelines using an Ember package, uh, but it's not limited to Ember package. Uh, most of those, those libraries are SVG based, except one of them, which is a chart.js, 
And as I was talking about SVG and Canvas, today we're going to focus on SVG and Canvas. So I'm going to try to uh, compare these two libraries through all of the scenarios, uh, see which one is the most readable in each case. And uh, well, let's get started. So the first scenario is that we are, uh, we're all working for a marketing company. I'm sorry. And <laughs> And we want to display uh, how well we're doing. So we want to display the reach uh, we have on a monthly basis. So we just display uh, simple bar charts that can be satisfying. So if we just listen to what er everyone is going to say, we're going to start with this 3 gs because it's the industry standard uh, and it does a lot of things way better than others. First of all, it's very precise. It gives you a very precise control over um, how to define your SVG elements. Uh, it comes with a bunch of uh, mathematical and geometrical functions that make very complex uh, stuff quite easy. So it's it's a bit more than a, just a charting library. It's, it's kind of a set of building blocks to define your own uh, charting framework. So if we want to do something like this, a bar chart, just displaying values uh, over different months, we would have to define a few basic elements to set our chart up with uh, this 3GS. So basically, we would start by defining a container. So we select our SVG elements in the templates. That's where we're going to draw the chart. Then add some margins. Then define uh, our scales uh, from um, using ranges. So ranges is the physical space that the chart is going to take uh, on the screen. We can define domains so that the mathematical space, the space that our values are taking. Then we can draw axis, add some ticks to that axis, one tick per data points, perform the data binding, so making the links between our data and uh, the charts, and finally adding some styles. So that, uh, that's a lot of code to, to do this. And we said that we wanted to build fast. So the deadline is tight. There's maybe something easier to just uh, render a bar chart. So if we check out chart.js and we see straight away that it can be done in 10 lines of code, more or less, I made a focus here on uh, the Ember CLI chart uh, package, which is a really nice Ember wrapper for chart.js. So it's super easy to use, as you can see, you just uh, define a data property. You can uh, have an array of data sets. And uh, each data set is pretty much an array of values, a color, and here a label. That's enough to do the basic charts we need to do. And we pass this down to our Ember chart wrapper. But at, at this stage, a designer might get back to us and tell us that there is a border radius on each bar. So <laughs> is that going to be the point where we don't know how to do that? Well, no, it's, it's still pretty much okay with charges. And that's the case for everything that, that comes from basic to mid-level customization. As long as it's been uh, thought through by the chart GS team, uh, it's easy to do it and it's easy to have this kind of a uh, slight uh, customization. So if it, that is easy to understand, uh, to configure, to implement in a few minutes, uh, if the documentation is quite extensive, the question is how far can we go just using that? What if we needed something a little bit more complex? So for instance, we are have to display uh, the breakdown of this reach per uh, countries. We want to see how well we're doing in France and Spain and in Germany. We want to have our revenue displayed as well. Well, in this case, we just need to expand our data set and add a few more data. So one array for each country, one uh, array for our revenue, different colors. Uh, well, that's still quite easy. We just have to configure the chart and this, uh, set the, uh, the stacks behavior for each of our axes, X and Y axis. And we pass this down to the wrapper and that's it. So, so far, so good. Another use case, if we want to show our revenue from 1975 to today, on a daily basis, on a daily granularity, that will come down to 17,000 data points to show. 
and there would be as much elements in the dome if we want to display uh, uh, well everything. The good thing with ShortJS is since uh, it uses Canvas, it's still going to be one DOM element. And for charts of this size, reasonably sized charts, like uh, 750 per 250, the performance is uh, very steady and doesn't uh, correlate with the number of data points you're going to have. So if you are using very large data sets, that's a real advantage that ShortJS will provide you, apart from writing code faster. But we want to go to the next level. We want to add some delight to the chart and we want the users to be able to, to see a little more information uh, and satisfy the designer as well, like even more. So there we're going to try to display a tooltip. We're still using ChartJS. And using ChartJS, this is no line of code because tooltips are native. Uh, I said that they are partially customizable in the sense that uh, ChartJS tooltip have a predefined layout. So they come up with a header, a footer, uh, a few sections, and you can change the labels for each of the sections as long as it's within the realm of what is uh, predefined. And to do that, you use callback, like uh, shown here in the plugin uh, property. But if we want to really apply the, the styles that we want and have the layout that we want for the tooltips, uh, the code for uh, performing these kind of things with ChargeJS will look more like this. And that, that could be, that can be unexpected. It's uh, the kind of complexity explosion that we don't really want to have in a running project. Uh, it's very hard to test, very hard to maintain. Uh, and the reason for that is that we are indeed writing custom HTML and JS uh, to be rendered in Canvas. That's pretty much one of the only ways to, to do this. Uh, so yeah, styling and formatting uh, in a custom way can be very costly. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much no-go. And we wanted to avoid this kind of limitation. So maybe it's the right time to take a little look back on D3 and see how we would be able to do the same thing. One of the ways to have uh, uh, interactive elements using D3 is to use the Ember Tether package. Uh, so you have the reference uh, right here. Very nice uh, package. Uh, and if we assume that we started building our chart from the ground up using D3, uh, thanks to the Ember Match tutorial, for instance, uh, at this stage, we will be able to select all of our bars, the bars that we drew before in our chart, and using the events manager from D3, apply a mouse over to, uh, in, a, in a callback, just get back our SVG elements as a target, uh, apply it to the tooltip target property and display our tethered tooltip this way. So as the tooltip in that case is an Ember component, we, we are hands free when it comes to customization. We can do whatever we want. And as you can see, it is pretty simple. So that, that is made thanks to D3 precision because every element uh, is clearly isolated. So it's easy to apply any kind of styles to any SVG element, but it's easy to apply uh, this kind of events management, management as well. But in our example before, we were talking about a line and that's one of the main difference. Uh, if one bar represents one data point, a line can represent several data points. So the question will still be, how do you know uh, which data point you're targeting? I think this is uh, the right time to talk about all of the other geometrical and mathematical functions that D3 provide, because this kind of question can be solved in just two lines using a bisection, for instance. Uh, so what we're doing here is just retrieving all of our positions using the scale that we use to define our axis. So we just use the scale to get the positions on, uh, on the screen and bisect will retrieve the closest data points to the mouse X. So the X position of the mouse, which you can get uh, pretty easily using the, the event object, for instance. We talked about delight and delight often come through animations. 
So if you want to have something a little, a little tweak, uh, like not just bars raising, but like for, for instance here, having your bars going a little bit down before going up, uh, these kind of things, well, um, it can be made with these three pretty easy as well, because as soon, um, as we define states, so as soon as we have rendered our charts, it's very easy to transition between states using the transition function. So using transition is uh, duration and delay, we are pretty much able to define animations just as we do in CSS. So this is a, uh, this lets a lot of room for creativity and comes for a very uh, uh, fair premise, I would say. It's quite easy to put in place. And we can even uh, animate text. So if you want to animate text, which is an SVG element as well, uh, you can use interpolation. Interpolation is going to give you a range of, uh, of values between two, uh, here zero and our final figures. And the twin function coupled with transition will display all those values in a smooth way. And, uh, you're going to be able to animate any kind of text this way. It's easier with numbers because it comes in a, in an order, but, uh, it can work with anything, even colors. The final points will be accessibility and testing, because unfortunately, when you're on tight deadlines, it is the, they are the, the first thing to be a little bit overlooked, but this is especially true when it comes to data viz, because most libraries don't even consider it. It's, it can be very hard to find the proper tools, uh, to perform testing and accessibility even more. So here, how do we make it to reach a good score accessibility wise? when uh, we want to build a dashboard. Well, if we stick with these three, we can leverage on the attribute function because the attribute function allows uh, to define any kind of custom attributes. So just like as, as if we were um, uh, defining our SVG element directly in the template. So that means that we can, uh, we can uh, any kind of elements from, uh, from our chart, basically, uh, the scales, uh, any kind of, uh, label can hold an area label or an area description. So we will be able to go as far as making our chart fully screen readable, which is, uh, if you want to do the kind of, uh, this kind of thing is using chart JS, you would basically have to duplicate your chart into a hidden table, uh, to make it screen readable. So just doubling your work and it goes, uh, the same way for testing. Since we can have custom attributes, we can have custom testing attributes as well. Uh, and that allows us to step away from only visual testing when it comes to testing, uh, the dashboard. Uh, one of the things that comes with visual, when you do visual testing, uh, is that, uh, your charts are going to be dynamic. They're going to be changing through, through the time and that will break visual, visual uh, testing. So it's way easier to test how your charts are going to be rendering if you're able to target precisely each element of the chart, just like, just like this here, we, we are able to target each of our bars and see exactly well how many bars we have, uh, which tile they, they take in different states because we can use everything that comes with a Q in it. Um, and yeah, that, that's, uh, that comes in very handy and same very, uh, it's very simple to put in place even at the end of the project. So we've been text, uh, talking about, uh, accessibility, how to comply with, uh, IA standards, how to target our elements in a precise way, uh, and the link events. We talked about animation and interactivity, uh, using interpolation, making, uh, our chart very, uh, custom. Uh, we talked about how to configure a chart to make it a little bit more complex and how steep the learning curve can be for each libraries, uh, and how to set them up uh, quickly. So all of this can come down to one question, which would be at the start of a project, where do you want to go? So if you decide to, or if you just need to have a basic or even a little bit more complex chart to display, uh, it doesn't require much effort to go with charges, but it's going to give you the same level of quality basically. And it's only when you 
want to go for something more interactive, something more custom, if you have very precise needs when it comes to customization, that D3 is going to show um, how easy it is once everything is set up uh, to go further. So it's, it is the same for accessibility and testing at this stage. Uh, it comes for, it is very easy to put in place at any time with D3, and it's nearly impossible for most libraries. So keeping all those potential bottlenecks in mind, uh, complexity, data set size, uh, the display of the charts on the screen, if you need responsiveness or accessibility or testability, it's probably easier to choose the right uh, ship to navigate data visualization, uh, but they don't go at uh, they, they don't go at the same place basically, and they won't take you there at the same pace. So that's it for me today. Thanks a lot for your attention, and uh, you can reach me on uh, LinkedIn. I'm uh, Alexis Fares for a further question later. Thank you very much.